every episode that we do uh, for the viewers. Uh, just know that we're here. Uh, we want to like impart wisdom. We want to make sure that you understand that our journey is to be shared. So when you click on, you know, watch it all the way through. You know, don't be doing two different things at once. Don't be on your phone doing looking at Facebook. Take this wisdom because I know that I benefit in my life today because of the wisdom that people imparted in me. What's going on, family? Welcome to another edition of the Rise to It podcast, your home for personal and professional development. My name is Jonathan Hernandez, a.k.a. the letter H. And with us today, we got our boys, Mr. DJ Sal Cortez, Mr. Andre Covington, Mr. Frankie Leal. What's going on? Hey. What's going on? Man. I'm, I'm up now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, speaking of... Man, just positivity and our new episode in 2023, we're, we're moving and shaking. We just finished off an incredible, incredible event at Burton Middle School, the Lead the Way Conference. What did you guys think about that, man? Because they brought the heat, they brought the energy, and it was consistent throughout the whole event. DJ Sal, starting with you, man, what's up? Man, it was electric. I got to say it's one of the top ever of all the schools that we've done. So I, I'm just yeah, saying bold, in my yeah. personal experience okay. the, uh, the the kids out there were just different. And I'm, again, I don't know that it's the culture or if it's the kids, I don't know what it is, but it was definitely, man, uh, the energy was there when we walked on the campus, um, the way that they greet. Uh, I don't know what that was. I never figured that out. I'd love to find out. Uh, so all the kids cheer on, as other kids are getting dropped off from school, they had like oh, the, the yeah. Tucanes bumping. Like yeah. it was, it felt like yeah. a whole energetic cheer section. Mm -hmm. Even uh, the cheerleaders, they had their cheerleaders at, which was something that <laughs> yeah. apparently they haven't had for 10 years. And this was the first year bringing them back. But when the cheerleaders came in, the cheerleaders had a cheer squad cheering for them. <laughs> right. So that's how it, extra it was, man. It yeah. was, it was great. It was one of the, the, I'd put it at one of the top five ever. Ooh, nice. that's yeah. bold. All right. Yeah. So other schools, other colleges, universities, you better bring that energy, man. <laughs> Step it up. Just, just go sure. back and watch the, the, the highlights, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You'll know where the bar's at. <laughs> the whole day, man, was full of highlights. I know Dre, you spoke. We had Amanda Aguilar from ABC 30 Fresno come join us. Yes. She killed it. But Dre, what was your experience at Burton Lead the Way Conference? Conference. It's definitely the culture. I think you, the administrators, you know, the powers to be at that school, they get it. They understand that, you know, we have to really build unity. We have to get them to work together as a, as a unit, as a team, as a school, you know, and if we do that, uh, we will weed out uh, the non-participants. And I think that's what makes any situation successful when you get everybody to buy in, you know, and those who aren't buying in, well, then you know what, they'll, they'll weed them out and they'll be forced to get involved. Right. You know, you see, I look, I look at the sea of eyes when I'm speaking and uh, in that particular uh, situation, they were locked in, you know, and they were really, uh, their emotions, like when I was using my slideshow, and by the way, sorry, I inundated you with a lot of photos on this one, <laughs> more than I ever <laughs> had. had a full but, load of pictures, yeah. there, but it was great. They were great. Had a whole family album. I, yeah. had a, I had a story to tell, I wanted to yeah. paint it all the way through, especially getting the bully inside, how it's affected Everyone in my family, including myself, and everyone had a story to be told. And I didn't even uh, get into my wife's story. You know, she was kind of like callous behind it. But uh, I told her, I'm going to save you for another day where you'll be the, the soul. I mean, her story was just this was really deep. So mm. um, it's just it was the culture, man. I think when we came into it, we walked into uh, just a monsoon of positivity. Yeah. And uh, it was good to be a part of that. And uh, yeah, Burton, you guys, you guys are fire, man. You guys are definitely fire. Let's, let's give one up for Burton. Yeah. yeah for sure, for sure. 
And speaking of Burton, man, we got to do a special ring for the Rise to It 1K giveaway recipients, man. That wow. was incredible. Yes. So if you guys don't know, towards the end of the uh, event, um, we surprised them with the big Rise to It check. And there was actually two students, 500 a pop, mm -hmm. that ended up our winners. And I should, big shout out. Big shout out to Kristen and Arwin, our Rise to It 1K giveaway winners. Excellent job. But also, again, Dre talking about the culture, DJ Sal talking about the culture. I know, Frankie, mm -hmm. you've been there before, too. Mm -hmm. So, Frankie, you know the culture very, yeah. very well. Um, but shout out to Principal mm -hmm. uh, Casey Rangel and also the Superintendent Sergio Mendoza. Mm -hmm. Like, the treatment we get there and, again, the culture, all the teachers were there, all the admin was in there. We don't see that very often. So, shout out mm -hmm. to Burton, man. Great uh, um, uh, what is the superintendent's name? Sergio Mendoza. Now, tall gentleman. Sergio is a little bit shorter. No, short. Oh, yeah. I know exactly who yeah. it is. There was another taller gentleman who yes. came up afterwards, yes. and uh, he shook my hand. He said, see you next year. Right, yeah. Right. Like, that was know. Jay, I believe. Jay, yeah. he came up to me as well. You know what was great, Dre, about that event? At the conclusion of it, I got to get like this bird's eye view. I was taking some pictures. Dre had, was taking some pictures. DJ Sal was taking some pictures. It's like, man, it's Think about where we started, mm -hmm. you know, and now we're doing these shows and it's like, it's so cool just to see our team. And then not only that, but feed the community, man, mm -hmm. feed them positivity, feed them energy, feed them motivation. And so it was really that kind of like, we got to sit back. I know you called me like an hour later. You're always in the taxi wage, but I got to call you, yeah. man. Yeah. So <laughs> that meant a lot, man. Yeah. Thank you, man. And, and you know what? When I was leaving um, outside, a few students just came up, random students just walked up and started conversations, you know, nice. and uh, one uh, one kid, he was like, yeah, you know, uh, I played golf. And I was like, man, you know what? I wish I'd have started playing when I was your age. I play now. And we, he said, what's your handicap? I said, like, I'm a six. You know, I said, but he goes, my dad plays. He's pretty good. I said, yeah, but if I play with your dad, I'm a 15. That way I can get some money out of him. I started laughing. But I told him, I said, hey, you know, you need to um, w focus on it now. I said, if you enjoy doing it, lock in at an early age. Because by the time you get in high school, there, there are opportunities there's scholarships, there's all kinds of things right now mm. that especially minority students uh, have access to. And uh, his eyes were getting big. He was, like, he was like, yeah, man, work on it right now. This is the time for you to, to hone your craft. And so, yeah, man, and it just left a good feeling in my heart knowing that, that they walked away and I could see their little brains were just clicking like, mm -hmm. you mean I can I can right. get a scholarship doing this? Yeah. You mean I can make a professional? Yeah, if you so choose. But it can just get you to other places mm -hmm. if you, cho you know choose right. Yeah, you know, the topic that we did, and if, for those of you that don't know, every school we go to and we're blessed to have the opportunity to pour into others, we always change it up. It's never like one cut, one size fits all. We're always going back to the drawing board. Yeah, it takes some extra work, mm. but we're totally down for that and putting in the work and making sure that our message is tailor fit to wherever we're at. And so Burton Middle School for their Lead the Way conference, they wanted us to really highlight bullying and the mm. importance of respect. And so it got a few of us thinking about how we got started. You know, bullying is something that I tell my students, even in the college age, they're adults, mm. but I tell them it doesn't stop when you're an adult. And so that's something that a lot of people don't know until they're an adult and they experience that, whether it's the titles, where it's the college they went to, whether it's they're living on this side of town, whatever it is, that really doesn't stop as an adult. And so it got us thinking mm. about us as a group, as a team, as a family, we each have our own individual businesses that are completely different. There's a lot of things that are similar, but they're really different. And mm. so for us individually to take that risk and to take that leap of faith where a lot of people perhaps did not understand where DJ Sal was going with his vision, where Andre was going with his vision, where Frankie, myself. And so we really wanted to highlight the importance of getting through that negativity to get to where we are today. So DJ Sal, I know you started Bliss. It was just a thought. It was a twinkle in your eye, man, right? You had that vision. Talk about how you started some of the naysayers. I mean, we could call them haters, but maybe naysayers, friends, perhaps family. What was that stage like for you to build Bliss Events Group? You know, it wasn't, I wouldn't say that they were haters, but they were definitely the, hey, when are you going to get serious type mm. of vibe, right? <laughs> um, right. Nobody really looked at it as a, as a profession or something that somebody that could actually do to make a living. So it was like, you know, the vibe was always, when are you going to quit playing with your toys and, you know, do something serious? Right. And this is something that, that oh, man, it, it's been a passion for me since I, I want to say probably about eight years old was the first time that I saw somebody doing this. 
it was a different style, a whole different thing, but I grew a passion for it that never left. So ever since then, I've always figured out how to uh, get my hands on equipment and mess with it and try to manipulate music or whatnot. But um, yeah, and those those that were giving me that, uh, you know, the, the little, hey, what's really going on, were always those closest to me, right? So that mm. comes from the family, mm. that comes from within. That's like, uh, you know, hey, mijo, you gonna, you gonna go to school or what, what are you doing, right? right, right. Um, and honestly, it was just something that never left. So at one point, I mean, I was uh, in my early years, right? It was three or four jobs, go deliver pizzas, uh, uh, go work at the lumber yard, go work at, you know, the drugstore, uh, and then go DJ events whenever I could. So it was just always never ending. So I didn't get too much push because I was always doing other stuff. It wasn't until like the later, earlier 2000s, it's like, got a little record store, Um then it kind of, they were looking like, okay, so you got some form of business, but it wasn't the actual DJ and still. So uh, once the record store dried up, when everything went digital, um, I really leaned into the DJ and part of it, which were, that's where, I guess, I would guess I would say the more of the pushback came, like, for real, like you're working all the time doing this, but you know, what about doing that, right? Mm -hmm. Go, go work. Right. They don't see it as work. It, it, it was, and it was a hobby and it was a creative outlet. That turned into something that um, it wasn't until I saw somebody doing what I do now on a professional level, like in 2000, I would say that's like 2009, 2010. And that's probably when I was at my lowest point where, you know, house foreclosed. I had a house that was in the bad, that bad uh, loans when all that stuff was mm -hmm. upside down. Right. Yeah. Uh, got furloughed from work. Uh, and DJing is what really pulled me through those hard times. So not only was I be able to get the creative creativity out, but the angst and everything else, but it, that started to bubble. So from that fall is kind of where the DJ part started to rise. And it was Bryce too. Hey, 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 I, I saw hey, that. Hey, <laughs> hey, hey, hey. That's when I started to rise to it. Yeah, but, but, uh, man, yeah, I want to yeah. say it was, uh, right about that time when I started thinking about branding and how do I really get serious and turn this into something? Um, I heard somebody, it was, I think I've shared this or maybe who do I, maybe I heard this, the, the whole Kobe thing or the basketball thing, right? Uh, who doesn't watch or who, I think the question is, it went along the lines of who doesn't watch basketball? Mm, hands went up. All right. This question's for you guys. Uh, name one basketball player and everybody mm -hmm. shouts out one name, right? Mm -hmm. And when they do that, it's like, okay, you don't know basketball, but you know that name. Mm. Uh, how do you become that in your world or whatever it is that you're doing yeah so that's kind of one of the things that started pushing me towards making a name become becoming synonymous with djing and then my niche my lane where i really found success was really dialing in and going after weddings it was something that that came natural because my early stages of playing music was for family events so it's only natural that now i'm doing events for family events mm -hmm. so it all worked out uh in that sense but it was a long road man i would say I started focusing on weddings in 2009. Uh, here we are in 2023 where I can, you know, say that I completely independently, that is my life. That is my profession. That is what I do. Uh, and, and it's great, man. I've got a, a small team. The core of guys that are around me are, are Quality, excellent. Man. Yeah. Quality. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But wow. yeah, it was always the push, man. It was, a, I think it was the push and uh, all the hard knocks of life where actually the clarity came when I was at the lowest that this is what I'm going to do. I kind of feel like with family, they they feel like, well, hey, like get a real job or why are you doing music? Why are you DJing? Um, but like in their eyes, I feel like there's like fear. And, and, and it's not that they're, like you said, like maybe they're not hating or, mm. but they're, I think they're more worried to see somebody like fail because yes. owning your own business is, it's difficult. It's hard, right? So I feel like it's more... Uh, fear in their eyes to see you take on this challenge right because we all know that taking up like you know your own business um takes a lot of work determination um hard work yeah. you know well, i i've dug deeper mm -hmm. than that realizing that like my parents i'm older right in yeah mid 40s so my parents were a product of the depression mm -hmm. so for them coming them coming out of it basically it comes down to security right right benefits uh 401k mm -hmm. do all the safe stuff 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I've just always had the entrepreneur spirit where it, that never left. And it's still too right before we started the pod, we were talking about yeah. what other businesses are out there or what other lanes are we looking at? Yeah. So I just feel like our family members do that a lot because it's not that they're, they don't want us to succeed um, or friends are hating, but sometimes I think they're just scared, you know, because owning your business is, um, right. it could be terrifying. And for them, they, they don't have their own business, so they don't mm-hmm. know what it's like. So in their eyes, they're, they're probably thinking that, that you're going to fail. So I think they, they were just trying to, to protect you in a way. Yeah. Like in their eyes. Right, yeah. right. Now, I get that. Oh, they, every, well, what do they always say? I just want what's best for you. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nice. I mean, Frankie, for you doing photography, similar to DJ Sal, mm-hmm. hey, I'm going to be taking pictures. I'm going to do graphic design. I know you touched on that at one of the earlier episodes that we recorded, but kind of go into that. Like, how are you going to sit down, tell Celeste, I know when um, you talked about when she was pregnant early on, you're like, I'm going to take this full force. I'm going to do clubs. I'm going to be doing this. I'm going to take it to the next level. Mm-hmm. How did you really sit down and think about the future for Frankie Lee out and getting in like mm-hmm. the monster photography that you do? When you're young, you're like fearless in a way, you know, and that's like, I go back to our parents having those like negative thoughts or those doubts just because they've been there, done that. Maybe they were too scared to go that route. Um, but with me, like, being young, I just didn't really know um, what was coming or how much work, like, it really entailed. You just have no fear. So when I was young, I just kind of, like, just dove right into it, mm. you know. And um, when I started my magazine, we started a publication. And I remember going out and, you know, local, credible businesses that have been established for years would straight up tell us you're not going to be in business for two years like that was what they told us and <laughs> like mm. that kind of I mean we turned that in, you know like a negative into a positive for sure and instead of it discouraging us that just yeah it motivated us to, to work harder and um, that same business establishment became our clients for like 14 years and they gave us, you know, they gave us a lot of money, wow. right? <laughs> you know, a lot so, of opportunities. Yeah, they gave us a lot of opportunities, but um, a lot of it, yeah, did come, you know, for, with that no fear attitude, the like I can do it attitude, like why not me type of attitude, mm-hmm. and um, it, it definitely paid off, you know. Yeah. yeah. So. so we got music, we have photography, and then we have comedy. Yeah. Dre, I know you had a really solid career. It wasn't even a job. You had a full on career. And you left that to take that leap of faith for comedy. How did that go over with your friends, mm-hmm. above all your family? Yeah, man. And like, here I am. I'm 18 years old when I started working at the post office, you know, uh, which is a, a career job yeah. for a lot of people. People have raised their whole families, male men and male women, um, doing that, postal carriers. And, and I got in, I was like, well, this is a job for me. You know, I got this. I, I see myself getting a family one day, buying a house and just kind of like, you know, doing this for 40 years and, you know, retire, you know, like before I'm 60 and then, you know, just go and sell into the sunset. Yeah, that yeah. was kind of like the dream. And then I was like, I was doing it. And I was like, ah, you know what? I don't like this. <laughs> you know, what I'm saying? I don't really <laughs> like walking and running from dogs and doing this. So, <laughs> but um, I, I I think I'm pretty funny, you know. I think uh, people tell me I'm funny, so I started kind of doing the comedy deal, you know, and before I left the post office. And I, I did that seven, eight years, you know, before I had the, the guts to go, all right, I'm leaping in, you know, and that takes a lot, you know, because I had a nice little condo. I was doing some things. I had bills. So um, I just, I retired, you know, from the post office, took out, my retirement money up until that point paid off my car, all my bills, and then just said, all right, gave up my spot. I'm jumping into this. And anytime you jump into something like that uh, on a, le- a leap of faith, you got to really believe in yourself because mm-hmm. all the naysayers, naysayers are going to come out. Mm-hmm. I can remember my grandmother going, you're going to leave the government? The government? <laughs> you know, that's a job, boy. That's a good job. To do what? You know, yeah. I'm, I'm going to tell some jokes like, oh, are you a joke right now? You, <laughs> For real. But it's just one of those things, man. I would rather uh, fail and be happy that I tried than to stay in something and be miserable mm-hmm. and continue. So uh, doing that and, and, and had a, a great run doing just stand up. That was everything that all the money that came into my possession was because of stand up comedy. Then I did another leap of faith to go into radio. 
a whole another leap of faith. And that was kind of like, you know, I had to give up the comedy in a sense, come off the road and lock into that. That's another leap because now I, I can't, you need to book out in comedy. Like early in the year, people see me, your, your veils, you know, okay. I didn't do that because I'm like, I'm going to do radio. I can't. I, I got to put all my attention into this. And radio had told me we're going to give you two weeks. That's all we need from you is two weeks. But I'm like, you give me two weeks, I'm going to impress you. That, that, again, yeah. blame it in yourself. So an, another leap. So when you do these big leaps, you know, and I, and I think there's another leap coming from me. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not done leaping. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so uh, because at the end of the day, I believe in myself. And I think that's what's going to maybe get you through those moments of doubt. You know, and for me, because of my track record, it's going to help me. But if you don't have a track record and you leap into something for the first time, it's really going to come down to when you lay your head down and I go, OK, tomorrow I, I really double down on me. You know, I, I got to just keep on pushing because now the naysayers are really hitting you hard. The money is getting tight. And that's when you have your most problems. And you, the doubt comes in to go, well, maybe I made a mistake. Once you do that, you, you're defeated. Absolutely. Let's hang on to that. I love that, Dre, the imposter syndrome. That's what I was taking from that message. And a lot of mm. our kids, they feel like they don't belong. And even if they're killing it in their space, whether they're an athlete, like we were at Burton in middle school, they're doing well, mm. they get those naysayers and they can play with their brain a little bit, you know, and then they start having that doubt. Like a baseball player, we always hear it. I'm in a slump, right? Or yeah. a shooting slump in basketball. Well, as people, as professionals, you know, that aren't professional athletes, Sometimes we think of them and, and maybe they're taking so much of our energy. What would you guys suggest? Because it's easier said than done. Just be like, believe in yourself, have no fear. But we all had doubts, right? But we also had the power of, I'm going to do this. Like, I could see it. And maybe nobody else could see it, but I can. And I'm going to make it happen. So starting with Frankie, mm -hmm. how did you take your photography? Because I'm going to be honest, and you know that's what we do. There's a lot of photographers out there. There's a lot of DJs out there. But to separate yourself, what was your vision like? And what was different about your vision that made Frankie Leal? Like, I just wanted to be the best, you know. I wanted to be the best and like, not just the Central Valley, but I just wanted to be the best photographer. And, I, you know, my dreams were super big. Like, when I was little... I wanted to be an athlete. Like, who didn't want to be a professional athlete? <laughs> so mm -hmm. I grew up watching Michael Jordan, and I wanted to play like Michael Jordan, and I wanted to be just like him. Um, and then I got a little bit older, and I was like, okay, maybe basketball is not <laughs> for me. <laughs> maybe basketball is not for me. Like, let me get into something else. And I found uh, photography, graphic design, like, to be something that I love to do. And um, I just put all my energy, everything into, into you know, my craft. There's no disrespect to Central Valley photographers, but I wasn't even looking for inspiration from them. I was just, like I said, looking at the best. Yeah. Like, and and I, I just had tunnel vision. Like, this is this is where I want to be. This is how I want my pictures to look like, and, and I'm going to strive that. And when you, when you, you know, strive for that level, like, you're going to you're gonna get somewhere, right? Like, if you put in all that hard work, all that determination, you're going to you're gonna be good. Like, mm -hmm. if you just put in the time, you're yeah. just going to be really good. Like, today I was telling my students, they're, they're writing scripts. Um, they're making uh, movies. And um, one thing that high school students don't like to do is do, like, the pre-production uh, pre phase mm. where they got to come up with the script. They got to do the typing. You know, they, they got to think of, of the characters. They got to go scout. And, you know, for them, they want they want to just create. They want to get the cameras. They want to go out and film a movie. But, but I was telling them, like, there's no skyscraper that you can build without, you know, a solid foundation. You can't build a house with a with solid foundation. Um, no team's going to win a championship without going to practice. You right, know, so right. you got you to gotta have that foundation. And, I, um, and that's what I, I did with, with my craft. I just, I, I built a solid, solid foundation. And, you know, and there's days where, where you hit a slump, like you were saying. Like, it happens to all of us. And, but one way that I get through it, is I know I know that it's a slump. I know it's normal, and there's gonna be a couple of days where I don't feel like picking up a camera. Maybe it's a week. It's never been like two or three weeks, but it, sometimes it's it, it's you know there's times where I know I just I'm going through a rough time and it's gonna get better. Mm -hmm. it, or you know a shoot didn't go my way, like I just know it's gonna get better, and it's just picking yourself up, like you know just knowing it's normal, it's okay. You don't got to be too hard on yourself and, and everything's going to be okay, you know, so. 
That's good. And Sal, what about you? Like, I know Frankie was talking about sometimes you got to put the camera down. For you, when did you get to that stage of like, this is something that I'm going to take to the next level? I'm going to push through all the negativity that's maybe feeding my brain right now. When was that year? Do you happen to know that year that you're like, I'm going to make this happen? Oh, yeah. That was 2009 is when I first built my first website, right? <laughs> Went on GoDaddy and Go uh, Daddy. literally <laughs> had to figure it out. And I built the first, uh, you know, book DJSal.com, wow. right? Nice. But I think the transition to a professional is exactly what uh, Frankie was talking about. It's the work, right? Mm-hmm. So, like, when I think of myself now, I don't think of myself as a DJ. I think of myself as a professional mm. because of the work. Mm. Um, let's just say a wedding event is, uh, you know, when people would call for pricing, right? Well, how much for six hours? Well, it's not six hours worth of work. So our pro- we have a whole process, like a planning process, uh, going through there, getting their vision, right? So beginning to end for one wedding event, uh, it's an average of, in totality, about 30 to 35 hours worth of work. Wow. Meeting, well, first there's the, the marketing, getting them into your space, having that first meeting, uh, and then if it goes to contract, we have the whole booking meeting, right? And then we have the production meetings leading up to the wedding. And then we got to go create their documents, the files, the music, uh, send it to them. They proof it, send it back. And, you know, once it's all buttoned up, we have to coordinate with everyone else that's a part of their vendor team to make sure we're all on the same page. So when wedding week comes, we're good. We know that we're all dialed in. Then the event day is an average 17-hour day, you know, when I wake up that morning, I'm not doing nothing else but working on that wedding, whether it's I'm getting ready for that wedding, getting dressed, mm. putting my gear in, filling up the van, driving to the place, unloading, setting up the equipment, and then start working with the vendors, right? So for a wedding event, as a DJ, I do about 30 hours worth of work for three hours of actually spinning wow. music. That's the easy part, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's the mm. part. That's the fun part. Well, it's almost like a, a, a sweet payoff, right? So you do all that work, but then when you create those moments for, for the clients, right? Mm-hmm. When you see a 90-year-old grandma out there with uh, glow sticks on her head and hey. she's, she's getting down to little John, yeah. that's a moment. <laughs> and I, that's a real moment that I have on camera. Um, the professional part of it, like I love DJing. I still get chills when you, when you hit it on and you know everyone's singing and there's a whole thing. But the moments that stand out to me, like one of them is... Uh, I remember I was at Wolf Lakes. I was on the little upper thing, and I'm doing my thing. Dance floor is packed. This woman comes up to the booth, right? She's right here. She's just looking, and she's like, she's like, she does this. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, come back. I thought she wanted to come up here and tell Mm -hmm. me something. And she walks right past me. She puts her hand on the speaker. and She's just doing this, right? Mm -hmm. Eyes closed, smile Mm -hmm. from ear to ear, and she's just going. So I'm looking. I'm like, okay, okay. And it clicks. (laughs) She was deaf. Yeah, she had a condition, you know, you could tell she just had this headdress on and there was something mm. going on, but she just went up there and vibing. Her husband came over. He was just watching. He's like, yeah, come on, let's go already. Right. So he had to literally pull her away. <laughs> but for me, that was a really cool moment that uh, are one of the things that kind of keep me on my toes and doing more to create more moments for every event that we get to do. So professionalism. Right. So the work doing yeah. the work. Um, and it wasn't it's. When I started, I realized that if we did the work, I don't, I don't think about money. I don't think about, I don't chase money. Mm. I just do the work. And then everything else kind of falls mm. into place and lines up. You got to take care of business, right? But right. I don't, I'm not worried about that part up front. I want to know what I can do, what kind of work I can do before I get there. So um, in terms of DJing, it, it's a little bit of everything, man. It's a, it's a whole journey for each right. and every event that we do. Right. Yeah, so Sal, and if you guys don't know, Sal really doesn't care about money because there's sometimes he's like, ah, whatever, John. And you're literally <laughs> off to the next event. And I'm like, no, like, let me, let me take care of that. You're like, dude, I don't care. Like, really, I don't. So, right. but where was that? Like Frankie, it was just kind of that, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to make sure that I, I do this and I'm going to do it at a very high level. I know you talked about the events and how much work goes into that. Mm-hmm. Was it just that routine that got you into that groove of like, I'm doing this and I'm going to do it at the highest level? Like, how did you separate yourself from all these other DJs or a wedding no, company? I, I think it was just that. Like, mm-hmm. even on event day, showing up three hours before yeah. the, the first person go. shows up, right? Where most, it was pretty known, or, and people still do it today, where they show up like literally an hour before the event starts. I could never do that. Mm-hmm. Um 
I don't know. I guess that comes from caring about the event and the work and everything that we do. But um, yeah, man, I, I couldn't imagine doing what the other guys do. I just knew what I wanted to do, make me comfortable. Yeah. And that kind of became the standard. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and, and I've noticed that there's a lot of other people that kind of followed suit for what we were doing. And um, it, it just happened organically, to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. It was just, how can I do this part better? And every aspect of everything we do, that's always been, and we still do that to today. How can I do this part better? How can we elevate this part of it? Uh, we learn from if there's ever if there's a mistake, we learn from it. We realize it, recognize it, and figure out a way to negate that. Right. Mm-hmm. So even so much so, like um, I don't know, people during COVID, we would get calls from uh, potential clients. Right. So a bride would call on Thursday during COVID. My DJ's quarantined. I need a DJ for my wedding. When's your wedding? Saturday. Like in two <laughs> days Saturday. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in two days uh-huh. Saturday. So what we would see is, uh, okay, if we had an opening, it's like, okay, let's see all your information. Send us your songs, your playlists, your timeline, everything. My what? Yeah, uh-huh. y- y- your documents, right? Where, where does it say who's doing what, what time is what? Mm-hmm. Um, I could send you the screenshots. So, you know, w- during COVID, we realized, okay, that part's really important. We were already collecting information, but we took it to another level to where we started storing everybody's information in the cloud, right, and sending it to them, and they proof it but it's available to any of our guys. So if, you know, God forbid I get attacked by a wild spider monkey the day before an event, <laughs> yeah. uh, one of the guys can download what's already been approved, show up, and there's no, you know, mm-hmm. mishap. So even little things like that. So when you think about DJing, most people don't think about all that extra work that yeah. goes into it. But it's the same with any profession. Yeah. How long does it take you, Dre, to, to craft, you know, a... Uh, 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 I, I guess, is it a joke? Is it a, a story? It's a bit, it's a bit. you know, to, to write a bit. It could, t- it could take six months. Mm-hmm. I mean, it really could. Because you will, it, you will write it, then you'll rewrite it, then you'll mm-hmm. look at it, then you'll go on stage and do it, and you'll say, okay, that, that part didn't work. You take it, you rewrite it, you go back on stage. You may go back on stage with it several times, but mm-hmm. it may be several different times because this particular crowd, that joke's not going to work there. So mm-hmm. this is not the place to do it. This is kind of like you know, mm-hmm. this is a this is a church event. You know, that joke is a little risque. <laughs> I might have to wait till this date comes. Well, that's all systems go. So it it could take six months to write it. You know, but the key thing that you guys are saying and, and to our, our our viewers, you have to understand a job is from nine to five. You have hours of a job. Your career, you when you're the boss, Mm -hmm. is from start to finish. Come on now. Come on now. I was waiting for that. I was waiting for that. There's no time. You don't have a set time. You just heard what's out. It's like, hey, I get up Mm -hmm. and I go. I like I have an idea what the times are, but I'm not basing my day on that. You know, and when you do something that's yours, it's your passion, Mm -hmm. you know, you might this happened, I know, you might be editing and your wife will come in like babe, it's three o'clock in the morning yeah. and you're like oh yeah, I, many times. I, I gotta yeah. i gotta finish this you know mm-hmm. I, I know yeah. I, I i didn't know it was that late but right. at the same time you're not looking at, there's no right. clock it's gonna go quitting time you know <laughs> old. it's the flintstone <laughs> clock you know it's like what is it's no clock when when you're when you have a a business a profession that you are locked in doing it's start to finish, and that's what that's your those are your time those are your clocks that you have to go off. So uh, that's why I look at a joke. You know, it's really it, it varies. You know, I've written jokes in one minute. I wrote it and like waiting to go up on stage. I'm getting ready to go. I'm like, oh, that's pretty funny. Okay, try this way. Oh, okay, go up. Boom! It kills. Like I, I mean, I just wrote that. And there's been times when off the dome, you're in the middle of a bit, and something else hits you, and then you do that, mm-hmm. and then that works. Mm-hmm. And you're like, man, I'm kidding. But then you can write a joke and just spend hours on it, and you go do it. And it's crickets. Mm-hmm. You, you tell that joke, and you're like, I'm about to kill it with this one. And like you yeah. in your mind, you're like, okay, I'm setting them up. It's like everything's hitting. Then you do that brand new joke, and everyone's like. I don't get it. Yeah. <laughs> and you go, well, we gotta scratch gotta go back and rework that. So but I know it's from a start to finish type of situation. So I'm not mm-hmm. worried about it because obviously I started it, but it's not finished. Right. When it's right. finished, I'll know and then that's when we're done. Yeah. You're onto something, Dre, for business owners, and this is something that I was having a conversation with some other of my friends that have businesses. 
And they go, it's really amazing how Rise to It, how you guys are together because we all have our own individual thing going. Mm -hmm. And so they were like, John, it's amazing because Dre can't love Rise to It more than you and you can't love his comedy. I put you on and we put each other on Mm -hmm. or DJ Sal, but that is our baby, right? And we do everything to protect our baby with photography, with Mia's career, right? Mm -hmm. That we, we try to put each other on as much as we possibly can. But then it comes back to that's that's us from that work from beginning to end. And with that work, you know, again, goes back to that bullying, right? That maybe it started off with. Um, How did you guys get over that? Do you guys still get kind of upset if there's comments out there? Because that's really something that we're seeing the youth, whether it's my college students, high school or middle school, that's affecting them directly, but also adults, too. So what would you guys recommend? Like for me? Personally, I, I see comments and nowadays I laugh, you know, like mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, that's pretty, man, I would have gone this way, right? Or you're making fun of my weight. I would have gone 10 times harder on that, right? Like on my face, whatever it is, I'm kind of numb to it because I've seen it and I expect it now. I, I'm already kind of beating them to the punch of like, this is what I would say. Like H is kind of slangish. Who's this guy? Like, you know, for me, I'm, I'm already like one step ahead. You, you, you're taking the, yeah, you're taking the, 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 the. The the juice, you're, yeah, you're taking the juice out of there. Like their, that Eminem, yeah. right? Eight mile, yeah. I'm going to yeah, make exactly. fun of myself. And then, you yeah. know, here's the mic, bro. Like, you go in front of the stage. The mm-hmm. number one fear of people is public speaking, even over right. death. That's been a study for like 25 years. So we're doing something that most people can't do. So it's almost right. like, all right, well, then you do it. Crickets, right? Mm-hmm. So I think when I put it in that context for me and my mindset, you know, that that helps me overcome, I guess you could say, the negative comments. But... Dre, I mean, obviously you're in the limelight, hmm. radio, Fresno, I mean, Central California, everybody knows who you are. There's going to be some nasty comments thrown your way. What would you recommend to our viewers, man? How do they piece by piece, not something just snap overnight. It took me a lot, long time to get over that, right? And yeah. still sometimes I'm all oh, that one kind of hurt, but nevertheless, I, I do laugh. You know, I smile. I'm like, okay, cool. They actually took time out of their day to come on on me. Man, I took about three minutes of your life that you're never going to get back. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, Dre, what about you, man? How do you get over that? And what would you recommend to build that muscle for these kids, these students, adults that perhaps are getting bullied? Yeah. Uh, for me, I, I stay right there. And what I mean by that is when I get all the accolades and the praise – and everybody, oh, dude, man, you're the best thing on the radio. Hey, I'm right here. Mm. You know, I stay right in the middle. I be, I, I'm, I'm gracious. I'm, hey, thank you. I really appreciate that. But I'm like, yeah, you know I am. You know, because now you're rising up to meet all of that and to be on the same level as the praise. And now, say, oh, you stay here. Now you go up with the praise and you get the big head and you're now believing everything. Now you're up here. Look how much of a fall you have when you hear when the negativity comes. I stay in the middle with that. Yeah. I'd be like, yeah, man, that's not that's not hurt me, bro. Because <laughs> And if it does sting me a little bit, if I go down, I'm still, you know, I'm not falling from here. Right. I'm only dropping a little bit here. And Love you're it. human, so it's, it's going to make you feel sometimes. You're right. going to feel it, you know, right. because like, well, that wasn't, especially if you feel like that's not warranted. Like, why would he say that? Because that's totally opposite what I'm doing. That's what really kind of <laughs> gets people like me who kind of stay in the middle. Like, well, really? I'm I'm angry? Like, really? I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm the, you know, antithesis of that. You know, I, I pride myself on being funny. But at, at the same time, I have to understand. I got to stay middle ground. Mm-hmm. And that keeps me locked in to continue doing what I do. One thing I used to do at a comedy club, I'm killing the room. And there's one or two people that just arms folded, giving me nothing. And I'm like, oh, I got to get them. Yeah. I, they, they're going to. So now I'm working on those two and I lose the room. Mm, say that again. Say that again. I lose the room. Yeah. Because now, hey, look, work, put your energy towards the people who are giving you Preach. energy. Preach. Right. You know, if they're not giving you energy, they're missing out. Right. Mm-hmm. They're going to get in the car with their friends. They're going to be like, oh, that was off the like, ah, they didn't like it. They like, you always, they're going to give them that. You always, you don't like nothing. Exactly. Everywhere right. you go, mm-hmm. you know what? I'm going to stop inviting you. <laughs> now their friends <laughs> see go. them. Yes. Mm-hmm. I didn't have to point it out. I didn't have to stop the show and be like, what's wrong with you? Why are your arms all full? You, like, you must be going through some things. And like, the audience is like, what about us? Mm-hmm. 
Like, we were rocking with you, bro. Like, why are you giving? And then they have nothing but negativity. Oh, you suck. And like, oh, now I got to talk about your mama. Mm-hmm. Now, nah, like, that was a thing. Right. Right. Yeah. So in life, man, I think we can all learn from that. You know, give the same energy to the energy that you're getting and let the other, the negative energy just set over there and just lay in it. That's let them good. lay in their own negativity mm-hmm. and others will see it for what it is. Yeah. And Dre, I mean, ultimately, I'm thinking of you focus on the positive. You know, everywhere we go, we already know there's going to be a kid. There might be some admin, no matter what. But we also know we're going to kill it. You know, there's been mm-hmm. some events where like that was good. That was, that, you know, but then there's a student that beelines it and tells us, you know, that I'm going through some things. And what you said, like, really resonated. And so yeah. you just never know. Mm-hmm. Right. But focus on the majority. I always tell my students that I'm like, there's going to be one or two that just don't like you. They don't like your style. They don't like the way you speak. They don't like your look. Yeah. But if you focus on the majority and you can win the majority and you can do it consistently, like DJ Sal was saying, mm-hmm. now you're on to something. Mm-hmm. And speaking of that, Frankie, I know you got a daughter that's doing some big things. She had a new video that just dropped with Baby Bash, mm-hmm. right? And and so we've also had very, very long conversations, especially in the last podcast. We went out to dinner and we talked about some of those haters. And I go, just be prepared. I go, but they're not doing what you're doing, Mia, right? right. So I appreciate you and Celeste having those conversations with her already grooming her and kind of just mm-hmm. teaching her like this is more of a reflection of those mm-hmm. people and how they hate themselves right rather than a reflection on you you're on the big stage you know mm-hmm. so how have you really taught them that is it maybe because you grew up in, you, in that environment of like man it hurt and i don't want my daughter to go through that talk about that a little bit yeah well you know like especially with social media like me and my wife we and all of us here i can say we didn't grow up with social media but I've seen what it does now to like even with 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 music artists or with celebrities and how brutal it is. And um, I know if if she were to pay attention to every single comment, that'll I could like destroy anybody's career. Mm -hmm. Um, So one thing we tell her is that it's normal. You know, it's normal for people to it's so easy to go online and to say something way much easier than it is to (laughs) to say something in front of their face. Right. Um, But like you guys were talking about the majority and we tell her. And and I'm I'm saying this not that she gets all this bad publicity online, but we're preparing her for it. Um, you know, we tell her like, look at the Ariana Grande's, uh, Justin Bieber's. Yeah. They have their share of hate, and these are some of the best singers right out mm-hmm. right now. So um, it's normal. It kind of comes with the territory, and in a way, it's it's flattery. You know, like you're saying, if you're taking the time, yeah, if you're taking mm-hmm. the time to to make fun of me, then I'm doing something right. You know, I'm doing but it sucks that it's it's normalized, you know? Right. Like, yeah. it really is. It's kind of like normal behavior for a lot of people just to to want to tear somebody down. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of the sad part about our society it as is. a whole. It is. And the way that we assure her that you're good is by the percentages of that. You mm-hmm. know, if there's 95%, 99% of positive energy coming your way, then yeah. you got to focus on that, worry about that. And the 4 the 3%, and then... It's it's just part of the game. It's normal. If you get um, three hits out of ten in baseball, you're in the Hall of Fame, baby. There you go, three hundred right. exactly. Yeah, right. right. Hall of you do that yeah. consistently, yeah. over fifteen, eighteen years. Psh, Hall of Fame. You're yeah. considered one of the greatest ever, yeah. just mm-hmm. by being what many people would say mediocre. Three, do three out of ten on anything. Exactly. You know, yeah. <laughs> take three, a test and get do, three. Do three right. out of ten in my yeah. class. Yeah, well, that works out for you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> for but sure, in yeah. certain things. That's okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. She's, she's gone to shows where, and it kind of like, I'm learning a lot and I know you have daughters, uh, Dre, so um, I'm sure you can understand, but I grew up, you know, with just boys in my family and um, my, my first son was a boy, but seeing my daughter move into these spaces where it's like men dominated, like Mm -hmm. the music industry and DJs and, um, you know, performers and promoters, like it's, it's men dominated. So, um, what I'm seeing a lot is when she'll show up and say like she's opening up for somebody like instantly without knowing nothing about her, her music, just you're going first, you know? And, mm. it's, and if you look at her portfolio or her resume, her catalog, her songs, she's, she's more credible than all these other openers. Right. So yeah. once they find that out, Oh wait, wait a minute, you're going last now. Like we just found out from the promoter, you're going last, but why was she going first in the first place? Yeah. You know, yeah. so, um, her being a female is already, and it's sad to say that, like, 
you know, they don't see her as equal or this, you know, 16 year old little girl and stuff like that. So I'm kind of seeing this stuff now, like I'm experiencing it for the first time because I never went through any of that stuff being a guy, you know? So yeah. So that it's just, we're preparing, we're preparing her for that as well. Like, like, listen, there's going to be obstacles and challenges, but it's how you deal with them really. Right. Mm -hmm. It's how you overcome these that that's really going to make you because you can easily crumble and give up and, and quit and, and just, but it, it's it's how you just take all this. I love it. Yeah, yeah, it's how you take it in and deal with it. So, are you guys familiar with the rapper Lecrae? That's oh, my okay. dude, man. Mm-hmm. So we got to rock the studio, Q97 studio, uh, a few years ago, mm-hmm. and one of the quotes. I mean, I love that guy. We got to get him on the pod. We got we got to make gotta, it happen. But him, bro. man, I love Lecrae, and he was talking about if you want to be a leader, then you got to be prepared to not only take shots, but take shots yourself. Mm. And mm. The, the, the criticism, you know, the naysayers. Mm. Um, DJ Sal, I mean, you are in a profession where who doesn't know a DJ, but there's only one DJ Sal. And I know you're super humble, so I'm going to pump you up. I'm going to gas oh, you up guy. because <laughs> you absolutely deserve it. There's only one DJ Sal, though. Oh, yeah, I got a DJ. But there's one DJ Sal, right? Mm-hmm. When did you get to the point of, you know what, kind of just dirt off the shoulder, that hurt a little bit? And kind of just groomed yourself of like mentally preparing yourself for those negative comments. Well, you know, I, I feel like everybody has their own instincts and the own, the, their own way. And I think it has a lot to do with growing up. Yeah. I grew up with five brothers. So, mm. and I was on the, you know, uh, second to the youngest. So, you know, uh, getting, you know, roughed around a little bit, knocked down and always talk, you know, smack talking and always the last in, you know, getting pushed down the food line, you know, getting picking, <laughs> getting the, the, the chicken bones at the end <laughs> yeah. or whatever. Right. Uh, but I, I think just growing up that way, I grew up with kind of a tough skin. So even though there was some of that, I, I've always been more of the type like, you don't pay my bills. Like mm, I, I'm mm, not worried right. about what, what you say. Mm. And I know it's harder. There, there's all kinds of different types of bullying, right? No, yeah. So I can't, honestly, I couldn't speak on what some people go through. I know what I've been through. So my take or, or the way I've always handled it was just in a sense of, you know, does this person really make a difference in my life? Who's saying this No, mm, Right. right. Mm. And most of the criticism would come from somebody that's doing nothing. So I don't, yeah. I don't, yeah, <laughs> it doesn't mean anything to me. Yeah. They got a lot of time on their hand. Yeah. Exactly. So I, I think, um, if there's, if you've got a passion, if there's something that you're really into and you're, you're, you're really pursuing it. And once you start having success, I mean, the confidence, nobody could tell me nothing right now. Nobody could, st- you could call me the worst DJ in the world. Right. But I mean, I'm doing okay. So however mm. you say it. Mm-hmm. doesn't change how yeah. I feel. It doesn't change the booking that you have all throughout 2023 and 2024 already, right? So yeah. that's one yeah. person, but I'm still going to be booked next week because of the respect, the consistency, and the professionalism that everybody has here, right? And we do right. it in our way. We have fun, though, too. It's not oh, like we're yeah. robots. Like, we have a lot of fun being <laughs> yeah. professional, too. So, Dre, I know um, with comedy, you know, going on that journey, telling your family that you're going to be doing jokes, I mean, I see a lot of hate, obviously, with the whole George Lopez thing, too, and firing at a, a younger comedian that's yeah, in the game now. That and, was big. Um, yeah, bro. That has, that's, that's personal because it's one person. You know, it's not a team. It's just like, hey, man, I'm better than this person. I deserve to go last. How did you overcome that throughout the years in comedy? Well, you know, you, you find yourself in situations, you know, and the comedy, it's all about, okay, this opener is the middle, it's the headliner. Mm. And it's stages in that. And when you're the opener, you don't really get too much flack. It's just really you go do your thing. No one's really worried about you. You're not a threat. But for me, I was always trying to put pressure on the middle guy because I wanted his spot. Mm. You know, but there's a way to do that, you know. And so I would find sometimes the middle guy would get intimidated. And when someone's intimidated, they they will use bullying tactics, you know. Uh, They would try to go over your head to say something to somebody else. Why is that guy doing, you know, uh, he's doing over his time. You know, he should get docked or you should maybe just get him off the show. And these types of things happen. And you just go, okay, well, uh, why don't you time me? You know, I tell the owner, hey, time me. And he Said in time ago, he's doing exact amount of time. It's like you're struggling, bro. <laughs> they go back to the other guy, bro. Maybe I had one club owner switch us. Hey, uh, next show you're gonna open. Dre's gonna go after you. Why is that? Oh. He goes, look, it's the same money. I'm gonna pay you guys the same. And I, and then he said, but you know, you're gonna have to go because you can't follow him. You're struggling. I said, 
they can't be the same money. Now you're bullying me. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you want me to sure. do the next job up mm-hmm. and still get the same pay? I said, well, I, that's not doable. Mm-hmm. I'd rather just stay. If I'm going to get open and pay the middle, I just rather stay open. And he goes, well, I'll bump you up on some money. That's another thing. You have to speak up for yourself. And I know it's tough when you're being bullied. You have to speak up. You have to let somebody know what's going on you know, with the bullying aspect. And I, you know, I had the initiative to go there. And now when I get the middle spot, I'm going after the headliner. Mm. Like now I got to make mm-hmm. that guy work. And it's, right. and I can do that with my talent, not with my, with bullying, you know, mm-hmm. you let others make the decisions and right. not throw the hate, you know, but you've, I've seen it happen um, for me many a times, you know, even with big stars come to town and I'm opening up for them and, and then they bring their opener guy and that guy was like, well, let, let the local guy go first. I'm like, I don't know if you want that smoke, you done bro. Did it. You done did it. Yeah. And it happened a, a few times <laughs> yeah. with some really big stars. And then they were like, well, I, I was told one time Dave Chappelle came to town. I was asked to be on the show and I was told because um, the guy got upset. I kinda, he, was, he was kind of a bully. All of a sudden now he's slamming doors in my face. You know, we're in the meetings. Close. I'm like, I'm just trying no. to find out when the second show going to start. Well, they told me after the first show, second show, they go, hey, uh, you can't do no jokes. Just uh, go out and welcome the crowd. What? But we're still going to pay you the same. But, you know, and I said, why is that? Well, we're running late. And it's like, come on, bro. <laughs> we're right on time. I know what happened. That's the, so bullies are going to do what they do. But I, I went out. I welcomed the crowd. You know, we had fun. I threw out T-shirts. I didn't tell no jokes because, again, I don't want to. You know, yeah, I don't want to you know burn any bridges, but again, you're gonna you're gonna feel, even in your adult life, there are gonna be ways you're gonna want a promotion, and someone's gonna, hey, have you seen their Facebook page back mm. in 2015? Mm. They said something very negative, and you know I got a screenshot of it because people will find stuff on you, and culture, yeah. so you have to make sure you <laughs> you you take care of yourself, you do the right things, and understand let people know beforehand Mm -hmm. if you're up for a promotion you know there's a lot of people want that and they're gonna start their bullying tactics you may want to come clean with your boss go hey like you know i was 18 years old i put up a post you know and it got out there and i know people still hold it i'm 25 years old Mm -hmm. now you know i don't think the same i don't act the same Uh, but i know some people are going to probably use that against me because that's what they want to do to bully me but i'm a different person i just wanted to confront and and Mm -hmm. let you know there's ways around it man but it's coming you know, viewers yeah. is coming. The bullying <laughs> is coming for if sure. You've, if you've been fortunate to escape it th- your whole childhood, best believe is waiting for you in adulthood. Amen, for sure. And I tell my students that all the time. I'm like, if you want to be successful, no matter what you do, you want to be an entrepreneur, you want to go to be a nurse, you want to be a professor, you, whatever you want to do, no one's looking at the mediocre or the bottom, right? So that's why we know LeBron James, we know Kobe, rest mm-hmm. in peace, we know Michael Jordan. But who was on the bench? I don't know. But were they NBA players? Were they professionals? Yes but we don't know who they are. And so mm. my ideology when I go in the classroom is like, I want to be that LeBron. I want to be that mm. Kobe. I want to make sure like, do there's something right there. Like I'm taking something from you that. You know and, me. Yeah. And as a team, we do that. Let me ask you this. Cause we've never had this conversation. Do the haters kind of fuel you? Because for me, Percy, I've noticed that over the years, it's kind of like, I need that. I need that little extra jolt, right? Like mm. my car has been going down a little bit. I need that extra jolt, baby. Yeah. And so for me, I'm like, cool. Like I needed that to keep me. Maybe I am slipping and then maybe they, they are onto something. Mm-hmm. But the majority of time, I know what I do, right? And I take a lot of pride in it. And I know you guys do too. Does that feel you? Does that feel you? Mm-hmm. Like, does that feel like, what do you think, yeah. Sal? In my lane, uh, I, I, I work like this, to be quite honest. <laughs> I know it's crazy, but I don't listen to the outside noise. Mm-hmm. I just literally do what, what we know what we do, right? We know how to do. Yeah. Um, so to be, I mean, I, I guess I can't speak on this one too much, man, because I, I really don't listen to the static. Yeah. It, doesn't, it doesn't affect me in any way at all, mm-hmm. which is kind of wild, mm-hmm. but I think that was, uh, again, growing up, you know, uh, five brothers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They'll, 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 they'll thicken up that skin for you. That's yeah. for sure. With me, I mean, I I kind of, not that I enjoy it, but I, I do pay attention to more of the hate than like a compliment. Like, I, you know, nine out of ten could be, hey, good job, great pictures, we love your work. But one, one person could just do like a negative hate or mm-hmm. a hater, right? Like that's going to inspire me to, it, it just kind of like pushes me kind of motivates me more. Um, I mean, I love the compliments, but after a while, it's like, yeah, yeah. Like you were saying, like, I kind of mm-hmm. stay here. Yeah. I stay yeah. here, but sometimes you kind of need that negative energy to 
turn into positive energy. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, so I, I definitely pay attention to it. And sometimes maybe there could be some truth to it. Okay, well, let me, you know, they're saying this for a reason. Like with my business, it's not just straight up hate. It's just, I don't know, the picture's too retouched or, or just something like, okay, well, let me see what's going on there. And maybe there's some truth to that. Right. Let me improve myself. Let me get better. And then take his clients or, or I don't know, you know, it, just, it <laughs> yeah. definitely motivates me. Well, see, that, there's different yeah. types too. Cause if it's uh, uh, an ignorant person looking at something and saying, Oh, that sucks. Hey, you're kind of like, whatever. What do yeah. you know about photography? <laughs> yeah. Right. right. Yeah. But if somebody that was uh, a veteran of whatever profession said, Hey man, that could be better. It, I, or even if they said it in a way, Hey, that sucks. Mm-hmm. If it's somebody that you can talk, okay, well tell me how I can do it better. Right. Right. So mm-hmm. it, it, I guess you you can kind of control how that's perceived or, or ex- how you accept it. Mm-hmm. So they can say it, but it's how you decide you're going to take whatever it's a, com- a comment or a negative thing or mm-hmm. it maybe they said something and it does stand out like I've I've uh, taken criticism for, you know, uh why'd you put that song with that song? Like mm-hmm. that sounded crazy. I was like, yeah, you're kind of right. It did sound kind of mm-hmm. crazy. I thought it sounded good, <laughs> but then again, uh, the the proof for me is pretty instantaneous. Because mm-hmm. if it sucks, then the dance floor clears, right? Yeah, right. Uh, yeah. But on the other side of that, uh, to me, it's it's how you accept it, how you take it. Mm-hmm. I, I hear, you. and that that's I'm listening to both of you, mm-hmm. and and H also, and I'm like, you know, where do I fit in that equation? And just knowing me, I used to be more like Sal. I'm too I'm too locked in. You know, I, I can't be worried about it. But, you know, I watched The Last Dance, Michael Jordan, and I watched Kobe uh, had his award-winning, uh, the, the one you talking about how he loved basketball. I, I can't think of the name of it right now, but it was really, really good. And they both said, I use it for fuel. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I'm like, these are the greats. Mm-hmm. And I started listening to Shaq. I use it for fuel. Mm-hmm. I hear what they say and I take it. Yeah. So I'm like... Maybe it's something to that. Yeah. Maybe it's something to being mm-hmm. great. Right. Mm-hmm. Like you can be really good, you know, and you can have a great career. You can like take care of, but there's a, even where we are now, we're, we're good at what we do and we're comfortable and like we're, we, we're successful, mm-hmm. but there's another level, mm-hmm. even for all of us and what we do, there's another level. Yeah, like right. just think if you were doing this nationwide, you know, you had people buying franchises from you and you had mm-hmm. the blueprint to that, right, you know, right. like it's think if you were like on, on that level, on, you had an online class right. that was oh, yeah. global mm-hmm. and you were teaching your concept of photography to yeah. the whole world. For me, you know, I look at what Kevin Hart's doing mm-hmm. and I see that level. He's impactful. So now I'm like. I kind of want it. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm looking for the hate now. I get so much love, you know, yeah. from for what I do because I'm in the community. Yeah. You know, I, I'm always there for my my friends and, and family and and even listeners and and viewers. Like people put me to the side all the time. Like I, I give them time, mm-hmm. but I'm waiting now. I'm looking for the hate because yeah. I wanna. I feel like I need I need something you know outside of my own will right. and push. To give me a little bit, they what they mm-hmm. they said what? Oh, yeah. watch yeah, what yeah. I do next, yeah. and that's where I'm at with right. it. So mm-hmm. I hear what you guys are saying, and I'm like, and I I know I can relate to both <laughs> sides, but I think now I'm going more towards the yeah. like bring it on, yeah, yeah bring it, nice. bring yeah. it on. Yeah. I love that, I love that, and for me professionally in the accolades, Sal was going over them at Burton and introducing me. I was like, dang, okay, like I take a little pride in what I do. And you get to a certain level in all of us. I mean, working with Macy, like make, working with nationwide companies, man. I mean, I think I told Sal when we went to New Orleans, I was like, man, you have a deep resume too. Like, it's I'm really proud of you guys and what you've accomplished. And so my mindset, of course, I, I do use that as fuel still to this day. But instead of proving others wrong, which we often hear, I want to end with this and see what you guys think about. I want to prove people right. And so my man, Gustavo Enriquez, like, that's one of my best friends. That's my dude. And so every single time I'm always, you know, we're connecting. We got some good talks. And he's seen me teach. And I remember the very first time they told him I was working in Bakersfield. And they go, check in that dude, man. I think you'll like him. He's like, ah, oh, man, I don't want to check in. And I remember he sat in for the entire, it was only supposed to be like 10 minutes. Mm. He sat through the entire lesson. He's like, dude, you remind me of James Preston from West Hills, who we've had. That's our brother, right? Yeah. West Hills College. 
And I was like, I keep hearing about this James Preston. I got to meet this James Preston because yeah. this dude is something special. I heard about other cats talking about him. And so when I met James Preston, I was like, man, that is a huge compliment. And so I never want to let those guys down, my wife down, my family, my community. I expect the negativity. The higher we get with Rise to It, we're doing national things now. The higher we get, the more hate we're going to get from certain mm -hmm. individuals that aren't even in our lanes, right? Mm -hmm. And so for me, I want to prove those people right. Who are those people for you guys, man? Because I know we're, we're very passionate in what we do. And when we come together, we make magic. Chris Angel status, right? So hmm. who are those people, man, that really you're like, I can't let them down. I got to make sure, like, I'm doing the very best I possibly can. Starting with Sal. Oh, that's always going to be the family, right? right? It's the family. And I consider my Bliss, the, the Bliss Events Group, yeah. the core. I mean, man, that that's family there. And then it branches out just like a family tree. From there, it's the vendors that we work with. It's the the clients that choose choose us, right? We don't want to let any of those people yeah. down because, uh, I mean, it really, if if we fail an event, we don't just fail ourselves or you know myself. It could ruin an entire somebody's. You know, it's the biggest day of their life, right? And mm. it's probably the biggest party they're ever gonna throw for themselves, and they drop. I mean, we've done weddings that were anywhere in the range from twenty to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, right, on one day. Wow! Mm. And we have the responsibility of pulling that all together and creating something special out of it with them and for them. So, uh, but you know, immediately it's always going to be at the core family. I think that's true for anybody. And then just like that family tree, man, it branches down, and uh, ultimately it comes down to the roots that we we've, we've been working, that we've been growing, and that had been spreading since, you know, when I, I launched for us back yeah. in 2009. Yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah. yeah. And a quick blurb about Sal, man. When we're in New Orleans, this dude's waking up with me like at, I don't even know, 435. <laughs> <laughs> to get some cold medication. He's uh, like, I'm going to rock with you, man. We'll see if you wake up. My homie, was he was, wait, oh, he was ready oh, to go, we man. Ready yeah. to go. Yeah, walking them cold morning streets yeah, of was, New Orleans. That was beautiful, man. Dre, about you, man, proving people right. That said, Dre, you got something special, man. Just keep rocking with it. Who are those people for you? Oh, for me, uh, like Sal said, it's my immediate family, you know, my wife and my kids. I, I want to be an example, you know, as a, a leader in my household alongside my wife. Um, I just feel I have an obligation to them to be the best, you know, I can do and, 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 and to provide. Um, my mother, you know, my mother's a minister, you know, and she's, uh, you know, been through her hard times. And now she's rocking and rolling and doing her thing, you know, and, and touching lives uh, from a gospel standpoint. You know, I would hate to be, you know, in a situation where I got locked up. You know, my mother had to come and see me in that situation. So I avoid all that type of conflict. But I got to tell you, even a little bit bigger than that, and it's not much, but a little bit bigger than my immediate family and my mother, it's got to be me, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. I don't want to let me down because I know how much work that I've put. This has been a lifetime for me. Yeah. And for me, I have to, like, I, I have to look in the mirror. When I look in the mirror, there's just, sometimes there's no one next to me. My wife's not there. My kid's not there. My mother's not there, but I'm there every single time. Sometimes my wife comes in and start brushing her teeth right next to me, but you know, now <laughs> we're sharing it together. But uh, those are times when I know if I'm doing me right, yeah. everyone's going to benefit. Mm. And when I start to falter or I come up short, everyone's going to not benefit. Mm -hmm. So I use, a, I look at the, the analogy like uh, a drug addict. They can never get right for their family. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They can never get right for their mother. Yeah. They can't get right for their friends. They try so hard. They only get right when they get right with themselves. So mm. for me, that's how I look at it. You know, I look at it, that especially having drug addicts in my family and seeing that, you know, if I was to get hooked on drugs, you know, uh, all that goes, everything goes away. You know, everything, it changes. The, the whole trajectory of my, my children's life, it changes. Like now they have to experience life without a dad, you know, who's absent. You know, he's on drugs. They have to see that. And that's now it's going to affect their lives and how they live with their kids. So... I put a lot of pressure on myself. Yeah, yeah. And, but you perform, though, too, right? So well, fight yeah. or flight. You I make sure gotta you do it, man. Right. Exactly. Gotta do it. Frankie, mm -hmm. we got the haters. They fuel us, yeah. but it's also, too, the overwhelming mm -hmm. joy of feeding those others. You know, right. like Sal was talking about it, Dre. 
who are those people for you, man, that you focus on? I can't, I can't let them down. Same, same like what both of you guys said, you know, of course, family, Mm -hmm. you know, the wifey who's been with me since high school and I do it for them. You know, the, the trips that we go on and everything that we get to enjoy is, it's all because of what we've kind of built as a, as a family. It's like a family business now I can say, Mm -hmm. you know, with that been going to school for film um, he's going to Northridge, and um, he's. It's just yeah. we've created a cool thing, you know. And, and also my dad, who and my mom, who you know, they both came from from Mexico, and my dad w- still works in the fields, and he worked his butt off. He worked too hard for me to not be successful. You know what I yeah. mean? So um, I do it for my parents, and of course, I do it for the family. Mm-hmm. We focus on the good. And we focus on the majority, and it sounds like that we're we're doing it, and that's what's led mm-hmm. to our success. There's going to be those naysayers, there's going to be the haters if people want to call them that, but um, they're going to have a long show, and they're going to have to wait a long time and see our success unraveling. <laughs> you know, yeah. that's that one phrase: "Talk behind my back, but watch God bless me right in front of your face." Right, mm-hmm. and so um, I always kind of keep that in the God up above, man. If He wakes me up, I'm ready to clock in. It's a little ball of energy, right? And so. Um, just family, you know, the wifey, Maribel, Mari, mm-hmm. um, just the whole family that I have, my community, our Central California that we serve, man, we're going to continue to pour into others. So there's a lot of people riding on what we do, you know, and I think that's... Including uh, for you, I feel like the taco truck guy. <laughs> yeah, there we go, yeah. Yeah. Successful. Yeah, I, I can't let that guy down, man. <laughs> no. and he, he's expecting the business too, right? right? Every Friday, he Saturday night. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> no, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that students or adults professionals the hate's gonna be there and the higher you go up man the higher you succeed mm-hmm. just expect that already and when it happens yep those rise to it guys they were right man here it is yeah. you know and so um but put your family first put those really mm-hmm. positive things in your life and keep that vision on that and i think that success is just gonna follow them so any last thoughts dre what do you think man about this episode we're talking about naysayers going into business you know doing things on your own terms and it's going to come with the price but ultimately some last words from you well you know what this what we're doing man this uh, i don't even want to call it a project it's it is uh, is a vision you know it is definitely a, it's it's an endeavor and I think it's something that's close to our heart. And every episode that we do uh, for the viewers, uh, just know that we're here. Uh, we want to like impart wisdom. We want to make sure that you understand that our journey is to be shared. You know, not kept. We know we can't keep all our success to ourselves. We have been fortunate enough to get to the level where we've gotten to. But we all know that it, it can change on a dime. You know, but that being said, there is a, there's a blueprint to this madness. You know, hard work, dedication. You know, you heard Floyd Mayweather say that. You know, you, you hear others say it, but are you doing it? You know, the fact that we all work jobs today. And that, you know, we all have family and we're here. So when you click on, you know, watch it all the way through. You know, don't be doing two different things at once. Don't be on your phone doing looking at Facebook. Take this wisdom because I know that I benefit in my life today because of the wisdom that people imparted in me early in my life. And I still hear those things. And the only way I hear them is because I listened. And now I'm using them. I've used them my whole entire career. So, um, you know, we're my my man, Dr. H, big house, you know, (laughs) you know, all of us are doing well. I'm about to go home to my big house right now and, uh, you know, and and love it. I don't say that to be boastful. I say that that is the the result of the hard work and the dedication that we've all put in. So take this wisdom each and every episode, use it, let it like manifest in you and go out and get it. That's right. Hey. Family, thank you so much for joining us on another episode of the Rise to It podcast. Two fingers spread. Try your best to stay positive. And as always, if you can rise to it, you can can rise rise through through it. it. Catch you later.